Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome to our session today, which is Keep Calm and AI On. I'm excited to be here with Gretchen Kiefner. Gretchen, welcome. Thank you, Tracy. There is no topic that has more buzz than this one. And you hear it all the time, you see it in the headlines, you see memes on social media, and I think the big fear is robots are here, they're going to destroy our jobs, and most importantly, I think we're not ready for it. Mm -hmm. So when a conversation takes hold like this, I think it's important to stop and consider why. Why has this got such a buzz? And more importantly, and I think this is when Gretchen and I were talking about doing this together, what impact this would have on you as an employee, you as a leader, and most importantly, with our clients, the organizations. So that's what we've designed today's session, is to share our lessons learned along our own digital transformation and debunk some of the myths. So hopefully you'll leave less fearful that the robots are taking over, right? <laughs> Uh, before we get started, let me just say there's a couple things, uh, logistics. Uh, ideally, we'd be sitting across from each other like Gretchen and I are, but since we're not, uh, I know people are going to have a lot of questions, so um, key here, don't use the chat function. Use the Q&A, which is at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, we are going to be monitoring your questions. We want, we, this, we want this to be interactive, uh, so please share your thoughts, and if you have questions, we, we will address them. We've scheduled this for an hour, uh, but no worries. We're going to give you back some time. We don't think it's going to take uh, an hour. We're thinking 30 to 40 minutes. Um, if you miss it, you have to drop off. The recording and the download uh, of the slides will be available. They'll be sent right to you for those that have registered. And we're also going to give people an opportunity to do a free consultation with one of us um, because we know that this is such a robust topic that you may have other questions you don't feel comfortable asking in the Q&A or want to just think about your own, how you get started in your own organization on some of the concepts we're going to share. So that's going to be available as well. Don't worry about muting yourself. We're doing that uh, as well. So um, you, know, you don't have to, have to be concerned. Uh, and any technical issues, please make sure you uh, Kim Angel, K Angel, at Growth Play because sometimes people have problems. All right, with that, here's our agenda. We kind of went through this. We're going to talk about the fear of AI, the impact on the workplace. And I think uh, what's important is today we're going to focus on the organization, but we have another session scheduled for April 16th at the same time, which will be about individual and skill development. Uh, Gretchen's going to talk about uh, how recruiters spend their time and then what you can do to get on your own transformation journey. So let's talk about the fear. If there is a fever pitch of a conversation about fear, which I love this slide because I think when I saw it, and it comes from the uh, Oxford University Center for the Governance of AI, what I loved about it was, I mean, just look at the title, right, Gretchen? Americans fear the AI apocalypse. It's, they are using these words, apocalypse. And any time that you see something like this, I think it gives us an opportunity to take a step back and really understand what are people afraid of. And I think that part of what people are afraid of is not just AI, because that's kind of an amorphous concept, but what they're really afraid of, I think, is the unknown. And what's interesting about this research, which is why I included it, because there's all kinds of research we could include, but what, if you look at these slides, what I think people are most afraid of is that there's some aspect of when you surrender control particularly surrendering control of something that you're doing, a skill or some aspect of your job, that this machine will take over and have more intelligence and will kind of run amok, right? So you look here. Now what's fascinating though, it, and this is true in general, is that the statistics are all over the board. So here you have about a third think it's really bad that high level machine intelligence will have an impact on humanity, it will be bad. A third think it's gonna be good and then everybody else is neutral or they don't know. The one thing though, and this is true, what we see not only from this study but across the board is not the, middle, the middle donut slide here, which is about 82% of those you know, that responded think that we need to be very careful in terms of how we approach artificial intelligence. So Gretchen, what do you think about that? I know you and I have talked about that. Yeah, well I think there's a, a spectrum here too. I mean, there is big AI 
And I think there are things that we certainly need to be careful about. And I think that there's, there are valid concerns out there about the potential impact and harm this could do if we don't control that. And then there is the narrow form of AI, which is really what we're going to be talking about today, which is practical AI that can really help make a positive impact to help organizations and people become more productive. You know, Tracy, you and I were talking beforehand about AI being in everybody's hands, you know, a part of the smartphones that carry today and in, you know, interactions at the grocery store or whatever it may be, anytime they're using technology, there's probably some element of AI attached to that. And I think when people think AI, they automatically think, you know, the robot scary part we've been talking about, but in reality, it's something people are already using every day that can be used for a lot of good, you know, if we are using it the right way. I think like anything powerful, we have to be mindful of how it's applied. Right. And that is exactly what this Oxford study, when I was reading it, was talking about is that it's about thinking different, which is, I know, another thing you and I have talked about, and we're going to get into that in a second. What does that mean for me? What does yeah. that mean as a leader? How do I think different? But it's about how do you think different about the tools that you have and, and the workflow and how people are using these tools to, you know, to our conversation about smartphones. That's just one example. And I think, to your point, when you talk about it like that, People aren't as afraid, okay. and so I think that the more we can um, think when you see these headlines about apocalypse of the AI apocalypse, you know, stop and think, what are they really saying here? Mm -hmm. And I think that that is something that um, is very useful no matter what the topic, but in particular to this. Well, I think thinking differently is right, too, because reality is, and we'll look at this in the next few slides, some people's jobs, uh, actually uh, quite a high percentage of jobs will be displaced but there's also going to be jobs that are created. And so, you know, how do we think differently and prepare for that so it's a really positive thing? Exactly. Well, with that, let's take a look at the next, some of these other slides. So Gretchen just talked about the impact. Now, I could, um, I'm kind of a, a geek when it comes to stats. I could go on and on and on about all the different statistics. And I think what's interesting about the ones that, uh, to Gretchen's point about the impact is, they talk about both the displacement piece, that yes, things are changing, but then there's also a huge part, which I am really hoping after today people start, start to look, there's just as much positive out there. And you, you don't ever hear that, right? So this is what's interesting. So uh, two thirds of Americans believe robots will soon perform most of the work done by humans. Now, first of all, I had to laugh when I heard robots, because like, what is a robot? Like, what does that mean, okay? Right. I mean, it, it, I don't really think a robot's gonna come in and, and upload my um, data to Salesforce, okay? Now there is a tool that you could use to Hello Dan and some other tools that you could use that will upload my data to Salesforce, that's a good robot, okay? I don't want to do that work, so, you know, but I'm not worried uh, that, that, that a robot's going to do that, okay? Right. Now, the next piece kind of speaks to that, right, which is the same percentage of the, and this is from the same study, of Americans believe that their current job will either definitely or probably exist in the current form within the same time framework. And this time framework was over, I think, the next 30 years. Mm -hmm. Well, how can that be? I mean, just right there, that's, that's, these two statistics don't add up. Yeah. We think that, you know, two-thirds think that there's going to be this automation impact, but then 80% don't think it's going to impact them. Right. And to me, these two stats tell the story. Mm -hmm. The story that AI and automation is changing work, but I think people have this not me, and you and I both know that's probably not true. That's right. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> Even if you think it's not you, your work, at least the teams you're working with or people who may not be directly related to you but impact your work in some way will change. Okay. Right. Now, when you talk to leaders, which is the next statistic, which we do quite frequently, 75% of CEOs expect AI, robotics, automation to increase. Now, what I thought was great about this particular statistic is they're talking about in the next two years. Mm -hmm. And there is a viewpoint now that we're at the tipping point where some of these automation tools will just rapidly change the world of work, which makes the desire and the need to change that much more, I think, pressing. Mm -hmm. Now, the bad news, which is, again, we're hoping that you'll – different after today, 
is while 58% of companies are redesigning their career models, they're definitely talking about it, this is such a, a, a paltry number. Only 8% are really ready for the future. So Gretchen, talk to me about that. I know you have, you see this in your work quite a bit in terms of people talking about it, but just maybe not being as prepared as they could be. Definitely, and we're gonna look at some data that shows very clearly a picture of that. And I work in the staffing and recruiting space, which at least in the staffing space is still a bit laggard to adopt a lot of these tools. And for those companies that are and are preparing well, they're seeing the benefits of having that competitive edge. I'm going to talk a little bit later about companies and programs that are helping to reskill. And so those things are there. There are organizations thinking about them, but it's not in the mainstream yet. Um, and companies and organizations are going to be playing catch up pretty quickly if they're not doing something now. Right. Yeah. So what do you think has to happen? Do you have any thoughts about how to get it into the mainstream? I know you're going to share you know, your best practices, but is yeah. it just things like this, educating people? or? It's taking the steps to get started. I think that's a big fear that people have too. Well, I know I need to adopt AI in my business, or I know I need to start thinking about my talent differently and planning for jobs that could be displaced or jobs that are created, but where do I start? And I think that you know there are lots of companies, consultancies out there ready to help, it's going to take leadership in organizations and ownership. Someone to say, this is happening, we need to do something about that. And then there are many outlets, like I said, resources, organizations to help companies you know, take that first step. But someone has to recognize it and own it. So I think you know, webinars like we're you know, doing today and conversations we're having today you know, help that. And for everybody who's on the call, you know, can you be the catalyst in your own organization to either own that yourself or push the right person to do that and be that? Yep. Great point. So as my friend Ben Eubanks would say, now some folks on the call may know uh, Ben. Uh, I, I, I use Ben. I quote him because uh, first of all, he has been researching exactly what you just said. How do you be the change you want to see? How do you, as an HR leader, take, or a leader in general, but his audience, he's the principal uh, and founder, uh, an industry analyst for Lighthouse Research. And he's written, I think, the definitive book, um, which is why I included it, about how to get started, which is uh, artificial intelligence for HR, using AI to support and develop a successful workforce, which is exactly what we're talking about. So how do you take the stand and then be that leader and to, you know, a very pragmatic approach to get a firm grasp on AI and how to use it to really make the workplace that much better and be ready for the future. And, and he has been out speaking, and this is a quote for, from one of his research studies, and I did get his permission to use this. We're, we're hoping to do a, another webinar with Ben uh, in a few months here. But essentially, I mean, he sees what you're saying, which is there's going to be, if there's an apocalypse, it's, it's an apocalypse to catch up. It's not necessarily, you know, the future is going to be here and people aren't going to be ready. And he's really out, just like you and I are, to give people this pragmatic way to prepare for it. So if you haven't taken a look, um, I would say definitely um, check out his research. It's one tool um, that I think you could really find some great pragmatic advice. All right, I'm going to turn to you now. So let's talk about current state and um, you know how people spend their time. Yes, exactly. People are spending their time doing a lot of manual work and a lot of work that's not where the money is and a lot of work that's not meaningful to building real relationships. And you know this is a snapshot of what's happening in recruiting today. This is actually research that a company called Clearly Rated did. Um, along with Bullhorn, but I would say that this likely applies to a lot of disciplines within organizations, not just in recruiting and staffing. So over on the left, you see in all those orange boxes, 
you know, entering details into an ATS or submitting candidates into the VMS. My Salesforce example. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and Tracy, I know when I first showed you this picture, you were surprised and couldn't believe it um, because no people, companies and people are still doing this manual work in their jobs every day. And we call it the swivel chair effect when they're taking information from one place and then putting it somewhere else instead of having all of those things automated. Mm. Is everything on the right source and screen and actually not even the 10% asking job order clarifying questions, that can be achieved with AI. Companies have started implementing chat box that can you know, qualify and knock out you know, certain questions or information before a candidate or an interview comes to a recruiter so that then the recruiter is having the most meaningful interaction mm -hmm. you know, with that candidate or employee about the next assignment or how they can up-level their skills or whatever it may be. So this may surprise some. For some who are really close to this, probably not surprising at all. And this is a picture of what's happening. I think in that slide you just showed, you know, it said in the next two years, 75% say in the next two years it's going to accelerate rapidly. Well, got a lot of acceleration to do because this is really where a lot of organizations are at still today. Still doing the manual process. Yes. So what would you say? So, so like there, I'll just use us as an example. So I personally would love a bot that did all my uploads for Salesforce. And my people in that work with me would be really happy because that they know that the robot, whatever that might mean, would do it better than Tracy Wick, okay? So, because I'm a relationship person, like I'm having fun with you now, I like yeah. to do that kind of stuff, but you know, that stuff is right. just, ugh, like menial. Yeah. So how do you talk to people like somebody else on my team, okay, who loves Salesforce, who may feel as though that right. you're taking, you're swiveling my chair a little too much, Gretchen, like you're taking yeah. control. Yeah. How would you talk to, to, you know, that person? Yeah. Well, I think that there is a lot that person could be doing with a tool like Salesforce that's even more impactful and would up level that person and what they're getting out of the tool. And that's actually a really good segue into the next thing I want to talk about, which is <laughs> how you get your information in the right places so you can derive meaningful information from it. You know, if that person using Salesforce loved it so much, wouldn't it be great if they could turn around and say, here's what I learned from Salesforce that can help us make a really important decision in the business instead of focusing their time in Salesforce just on manual data entry. And you said something really key too. You said the Salesforce bot would do it better than me. Right. That's it. There's so much room in all of this manual work for error. Oh, um, yes. Well, that's my team. <laughs> They're always calling me and asking me, did, yeah. you, did you mean to do this? And I'm like, what? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you don't know, right? Unless there's like this flashing red light. You don't know. And data becomes so dirty that way too. And ultimately for companies that can result in revenue leak leakage, excuse me, or you know, uncaptured opportunity. And when companies are looking to move fast and create competitive edge, you know, they can't leave that on the table. No. No, that's good. Lots of reasons to start along this path. And so you know, we've talked a few times already about how organizations get started. The first thing they need to do to leverage, and now I'm not necessarily talking about preparing for career pathing and preparing talent, but for being prepared to leverage automation and AI in their own businesses, the first thing is to make sure all of your data is digitized. Okay. Because if it's sitting on a piece of paper, if it's sitting in an Excel spreadsheet somewhere, you can't do what I just described and really get a lot of ROI out of your data, and you just simply cannot apply automation and AI to that data if it's not there. And ideally, it's digitized, it's in the cloud, and it's all in one system of record, so you also can apply it to all of your data, you know, front to back. When you think about, like for my customers, they're thinking about it in terms of the entire staffing or recruitment life cycle. Sure. But it can apply to a sales process or any life cycle as well, even in the back office. And then when you've done those things, you've applied the right automation and AI. And by the way, there's no right answer to this. It's how you want to bring those things into your business that really make your business unique and drive the value you offer to your customers and your candidates that leads to transformation. 
And everybody always asks me, well, what do you mean by transformation? That's really when utilizing, from a technology standpoint, when utilizing technology is just inherent in your culture. And it's a piece of everything you do across the business. It's not like implementing chatbots or doing this one thing or this one thing. It means it's a part of driving your business forward. Right. Well, what's really fascinating, because I had not heard you talk about that, but that makes sense. But what's really fascinating to me, and you and I were talking about this right before we, we jumped on, is Alexa or Siri, right? Yeah. And at first, when we have Alexa in, in our house, and when, when, we, when we brought it in, my, uh, my husband was just so excited about it, and I was a little leery, right? Because, you know, I understand the unknown, and you hear all these hype stories about it. But now I can't imagine working without it in my house in different rooms because it has really enabled me to transform, because I work at, at, out of my house quite a bit, yeah. how I do work. Yeah. Uh, and it's funny because I hear that, that it's, and I don't even think about it until somebody comes over who's anti-Alexa, and then I have to take a step back and think, well, what did I do before I had her? Literally, and it's not been that long. Totally. So that's kind of what you're describing, right, yeah. in terms of a transformative journey with your, with your own organization? Yes, yes, absolutely. And that natural language processing, like an Alexa or a Siri and Bullhorn just added this to their mobile tool this past year. You know, sales reps, especially on the road, yes. <laughs> how are they going to get, we talked about the first step, getting your information digitized, how are they going to get the notes from their meeting into the CRM? Are they really going to stop at the end of the day and do it? Some do, but most, you know, I would not, aren't. but my yeah. colleague would. Yeah. Okay, See, that's it. we're all different. <laughs> but if they're driving and they can say, hey, record the notes from my meeting, right, and attach it to this record in the system, then adoption is so much higher and then the data becomes so much more meaningful. Interesting. No. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm down with that. I know, yeah. I know my team's going to call you afterwards and say, how do we do that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Sounds good. Yeah, and I mentioned, you know, revenue leakage or leaving opportunity on the table. Like, the numbers here are real. And this is actually a snapshot of a calculator for Herefish. And Herefish is a technology that Bullhorn just acquired. And it's automation technology, it helps increase user productivity, it helps clean data, and it helps improve communication with customers, with candidates. And so I think a lot of people look at something like that and think, yeah, it would be nice, right? It'd be nice to have, but it really impacts the bottom line. It really drives hard dollars in terms of efficiency. And this is what you have to do, right, is build a business case internally mm -hmm. if you want to implement some of this technology. And there are, you know, easy calculators like this you can use or, you know, press the technology partners that you're working with to help you create this business case. They should have the tools that they can help, you know, help you do that with. So that's my advice here to the audience too. Right, so let's talk about that. So I, if I am the person inside my organization that you're challenging me to be, which is the leader to, to you know, lead the charge on, on uh, this digital transformation, you're saying that part of this is where you can get help is to talk to your, you know, your partners because uh, they could help you, again, make the case. It's almost like you have to sell it internally is what I'm hearing, right? Yes. And this is a way of doing it. Yes. Is that right? 100%. You always have to have the business case. Like, what is this really going to do? And in most cases, you can show how it's going to drive efficiency and impact bottom line revenue, but how it's going to drive top line revenue, too. Yeah. So the next webinar on the 16th, we'll get into this more specifically, which is the skills needed and how you retool your, your team. But how do you, what, what objection, because I know I, I get this uh, sometimes from my clients, and I certainly have experienced it, with growth, so we've been on our own, what I call you know, the digital transformation, taking our assessment to the cloud, and we're very proud of the work that we've been able to do uh, with that and have been recognized um, you know, by some uh, peer groups of, yeah. of what we've been able to do. Yeah. But I know it's a challenge for folks because it is doing something different. So right. how, do you, how do you address, well, okay, Tracy, but I like it the old way. 
right? right? So what, how would you respond to that? You know, if I'm the, I want to be the leader in my company, but my, my leadership team, you know, that I'm working with says, yeah, but, you know, it's not, we're okay. You know, I like it this way. You know, what would you suggest? Right. <laughs> you always have to think through what's in it for that stakeholder, what's in it for that business unit. You have to anticipate that because you'll absolutely get that. You're going to get it, right? Yes. yes. I mean, it is a, a sales <laughs> process very much. And so if you can paint the picture for them, the other more valuable activities they'll be able to do or the stuff that you know they don't really like that they won't have to do anymore, and that's a big part of winning over you know, those outliers or objectives here. Very good. All right. Good. And we already talked about this a bit too, you know, starting to think through retraining efforts. And this is twofold. This is if members of your workforce are going to be displaced because of automation or because of robots. And I know when we say robots, I know a lot of people think like of Wally or like an actual robot, right? But it's just it's technology bots that are applied and reality is that they will displace, especially in things like manufacturing, you know, functions in oil and gas. When we think of like light industrial workforces. A lot of that is going to be automated. Or we even see, like, my last experience in a McDonald's is a really great example of that. Last time I went in there, they went through this whole remodel. There were maybe two people that I saw working at McDonald's, but there were tons of beautiful flat screens for me to go put in my order. And then it comes, you know, right up to the side. So people are starting to see that on a regular basis. And, yes, it means some job displacement. So if that's happening in your organization, which it is, how do you get out in front of that? And this was a very recent study from McKinsey. Um, that's where the slide is from. It's talking about high-performing organizations, organizations that are always looking ahead. How are they thinking through this? And what's really interesting to me, I think the left-hand side is interesting, showing share of workforce that has already been retrained. But on the right, share of workforce expected to be retrained in the next three years. And it's so evident, you know, on the left-hand side, you have top-performing organizations who recognize, yes, this is going to happen, and they have a plan in place. But then those on the right, this is something that's not top of mind right now and not being prioritized. Um, and so, yes, I think I started to say it's twofold. It's, are you going to be displacing workers? If so, can you keep those workers and move them to different, more valuable jobs? And then part two of that is how do you then upskill those workers, whether they're going to work for you or if you're going to need to help them find opportunities elsewhere. Are you going to invest in that as an employer? And listen, we're going to have to have employers that do make that investment because we're already facing a scenario where there's more open jobs than there are available people to fill them today. That's already the baseline we're working with. And then you know, AI really changing how we do work on top of that, that is a big problem we all have to own. So again, back to ownership and leadership, how are we going to take this on in our organization? Yeah. So one of the questions that came in here is, um, which I don't know if we have a chance to answer during this session, but they were talking about, like if you're coming over here with the slide about the, the, the high-performing organizations, you know, how do you assess the skill set for the future, right? So I, I think that's probably much more about the April 16th one, but I think that yeah. that is the key of what you're talking about. Because if we know there's a shortage of yeah. these workers today, yet we have this automation kind of speeding up, what do we do? So any, we don't have to get into like all the details, what we can, I think, unpack that next time, but what would you say to that? How do you start to think about the skills yeah. to your point? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you have to learn, like, what jobs, what other functions will AI create? Yeah. If you're going to be investing in using AI in your business, there might be opportunity to move some people or hire new people into those roles. Um, I will give a very simple example of this, too. We're working with a customer right now who is essentially digitizing all of their data and then going to apply AI and automation to it in the middle and back office. So like the unsexy stuff, like paid bill type yeah. work. 
And I remember walking through the office with the chief chief operating officer of that organization, and he said, hey, Gretchen, you're going to help me get all of these people into more productive positions. And they're already starting to think through how they take someone who – you know, process his invoices today and help them become a recruiter at a desk ah, okay. and be productive like that. Now, not everyone's going to want to do that. And in that case, the organization has to be prepared for those conversations too. But how great that that organization is already thinking through, you know, this person is doing this today. You know, they have this basic skill set. Can we transfer them to this, which is actually going to drive top line revenue for the company? Right. Well, what you're bringing up to me that I didn't include in here but was part of research that I've been doing is I think there's two things, both, and this is a McKinsey slide, so there's the McKinsey, the future of work, which is where some of these slides come from. There's also a really great study by Deloitte uh, about the future of work. And, and what's not talked about, and I think this is a really important point because when we're talking about, you know, keep calm and AI on to, you know, alleviate some people's fears, Yes, there are displacements. There are some jobs that may um, be going away. But according to a lot of this research, there's also a lot of jobs. Like we're talking millions of jobs yes. that will be created yes. that are jobs that we, and I think this is part of the, the fear, we don't know what we don't know those jobs will be right now. And That's I think right. sometimes people are, well, I don't know if I want to do that job. I don't even know what it is. Yes. But I think yes. there's a lot of what you're saying that is not talked about enough that this company that you're working with sees. So good for them that there's this opportunity to really transform how people think about themselves. Yeah, exactly. And this may sound idealistic and, and really big, but when I say we, it's like the collective we. Like someone, again, has to take ownership and leadership here, but how do we start educating students? not even at the college level, but at the high school level, about the jobs that are emerging that are going to be in high demand and, frankly, pay really well, you know, coming out of school so we get more people into the right programs so we have people to fill those jobs on the other side. I mean, a big, big piece of that gap is not having enough graduates with the right skill sets. Yeah. So how do we fix that? It's a big problem. We don't have time on any webinar to tackle, <laughs> but it should be on all of our minds as leaders and organizations. Right. Well, I see you and I going to some high schools after this, all right, there and giving go. some you know, <laughs> career development talk. Yes. All right. So this speaks to that, though, right? And a little bit. It certainly <clears throat> does. And I mentioned this earlier that there are organizations who are really taking an active role and taking ownership of this skills gap problem and doing something about displacement of workers. And one of those organizations is EmployBridge, which happens to be a great partner to Bullhorn. And they're leveraging a mutual partner, Penn Foster, who provides online skills training. And EmployBridge has done a really cool thing that has resulted in their Better Work Life Academy. And they offer free skills training and, in some cases, certification to their workers, to their contractors that they work with on a regular basis. This is really great for them. I mean, they're, they're impacting the skills gap in a major way. They're impacting lives of their workers in a major way. And it allows them to place those workers in new jobs. So it's also really good for EmployBridge's business. Um, so it's been really cool to see this program in action, and I think it's proving to the market that it's something that companies should really think about and invest in. Okay, that's great. So they could check it out, Employee Bridge. Now tell me a little bit more about Penn, Penn & Foster. What is their business? Okay. Yes, so they specifically focus on online skills training, and they offer their services to an organization like Employee Bridge who can utilize it to fuel one of their programs. I mean, it's available to individuals or groups as well, uh, but them working through larger organizations, you know, to get it out to scale is, is a big piece of what they do. And I know they're growing really fast. That's 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 wonderful. I just I, I love this example because again, um, if you look at what is working about this, it's these types of partnerships. And then in some cases, you even take it another level, which is then the employee bridge Penn Foster relationship. But then at the level of either a local chamber or a workforce development council, 
Uh, and I just think that, that that is part of when you're talking about the collective we, we all need to understand that it's, uh, it, there's so many options that if we just, again, think a little bit different about this, we can really make something possible that hasn't been possible before. And this, is, this employee bridge example is a perfect example of that. So um, everybody check that out. It's, when I heard, first heard about it, I told her, um, I just, they sound so cool, I want to go work for them. <laughs> sure they take you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, so as we come, uh, we said, you know, we wouldn't take the full hour. I think we're, we're coming to, uh, you know, the, the things to, to think about, which when, you know, what, what, how are we going to put this into action, I guess is the way I'd like to say it. So first of all, I love this, just keep calm. That's the key. You know, we've talked about a lot of really good things happening in the space. And so what are some things, what I always like to say is that you could do as soon as you hang up from this webinar. What are some things that you could do? So let's talk about this. So what to do to be ready, because that's part of it. I think part of it is people feeling caught off guard. So fear is not helping, right? right? So let's talk about that, right? Because you have a lot to say about that. So what do you mean by fear is not helping? We saw in the picture of all the manual work still being done that a part of that is it's fear not only of AI, what's it going to do, but just fear of how to get started. So taking that first step to, one, make sure your data is digitized, and then two, leaning on your technology partners. There are also a lot of third-party consultants who work with all different technologies that can give some really great advice because they see it all. Don't, that would be my other piece of advice to the audience is don't feel like you have to do it yourself. All companies have to do this. And there are experts out there who can show you examples and get to understand your unique processes in your organization and help you put together a really great plan. So yeah. use them. <laughs> right. Yeah. So the, the, what, what we know about fear, which is um, a, a situation where fear is not, it, it can sometimes leave you in action. Um, and, and not necessarily towards things that it's like you double down on what you know as opposed to what you don't know. Okay. So I think what I hear is yeah. you don't have to go alone. No, exactly. Right. Okay. Um, so here's a question that came in. Um, so is there any way to tell if my current team has what it takes to make the transition? So I will take that one, and then oh. I'm sure Gretchen will have thoughts about it. Okay. Um, the answer is yes. So it begins with thinking about the future, and it kind of leads into the next bullet about planning for the disruption. So I think your example with your um, the middle office that you're talking about um, that you're working with is a perfect example. So there's a current state, which is a very manual process. There's a future state where you've automated a lot of those manual processes, and there's going to be a different skill set needed. So what you would really need to understand is what is the skill set of the future? And of course, I you know, run a talent analytics firm, so I'm very much about using data to inform not only what those roles should look like, but then how do you assess people? And so we have an assessment. What I think is really interesting, particularly, again, you know, running a talent analytics firm with an assessment now, is that the way that you've assessed people in the past which has been primarily um, skill-based training, is actually now there's all kinds of conversations where we're thinking different, which is all learning now is social, and motivation to change is a much bigger piece of a skill assessment of how the person can evolve. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because there's a viewpoint that skill obsolescence is instead of five to 10 years, it's every three to four. Sure. And so what you're going to need people is with a perpetual growth mindset. It's yeah. not so much, can I do this task that you're hiring me for today for a long time like it has been in the past. It's about, can I evolve as your business, to your point, transforms and evolves do I have the mindset? Am I interested? Can I learn new skills? Right. And then the other part is collaboration skills are very big because as everything's connected, my example about Alexa or your example about you know, transformation is, is part of your business, we're all connected in ways that, that I can't individually learn as fast as is needed for the marketplace. So what I would say to this question is 
think about the skills that you're hiring for for the future, but I would put a bigger premium on people's ability to learn socially and also their growth mindset in general. Yes, I think that's right on. I would just only add to that that if you find that you have people in place today who do not have that growth mindset, you have to be willing to make a change and have that hard conversation. And we've seen organizations do that. And it's amazing when, you know, people come in who do have that growth mindset, what they're able to do and create. Right. So. All right. Let's see if there's any other questions. All right. Not now. All right. We'll keep going. So then at, to be ready, so plan for the disruption. I think you've talked about this, but how do you plan for a disruption, Gretchen? That just seems... <laughs> Yeah, you always have to have a plan, right? Even if you don't know when it's coming or how exactly it's coming. Um, but I think you said, you know, part of the fear is is not knowing and you can't be caught off guard. So planning is thinking out in front now, like really being intentional about having a plan for your talent that could be displaced for new skills that you're going to need be hiring for, right, and how can you upskill as a part of it, and then, listen, disruption is already happening. If you don't feel like your marketplace is being disrupted or that you are a part of the disruption, then you're behind, is what I would say. I mean, you and your organization want to be feeling like you are, you're leading the disruption. It's never a good feeling to feel like, oh my gosh, all my competitors are doing X and I'm not there yet. So how can you, again, just figure out a way to start? And it's following that curve, right? Like questions I would ask in your planning for disruption is my data digitized. Which kind of takes to the next point, right? Exactly. About how you position your organization and digitize your data, yes. right? Yes, exactly. Right. Can I apply automation in an AI? If the data is in a bunch of different places or it's not, you know, in a part of technology at all, it's going to be really hard. And so if you're in that position, and listen, you're not alone, again, if your company or organization is, then make that case. Again, put together the business case for digitizing the data as a place to start and then going from there. And what I would also say is that if you look at the map, and for anybody who's been to HR Tech, they know exactly what I'm talking about because you stand in the middle of this ginormous exhibit hall and there are a million different technologies AI, automation, whatever it may be, that can solve a lot of the same problems or different problems. It's like, well, who do I use? And again, I would use experts to help you figure that out, but first you have to know exactly what your goals and priorities are. You have to know the competitive edge that you are trying to create and the unique value that your organization delivers. Know that first before you start going and searching out all different technology that can help you know, I guess I can simplify it by saying know the problem you're looking to solve. Sure. And then that process can go a lot further. So that should give people comfort, right? Because yeah. that's no different than anything that you do now. Right. I mean, if you're doing business today right. and you're buying a, you know, a tool or using a tool or some kind of a way of working, you always say, you know, you start with your strategy and then you, what are you trying to do with it? So it's no different. Yeah, then it's just more choices, it sounds like. There's more choices. Right. It should be no different. But I think people see all this technology and they just go, oh my gosh, I should be using that, so which one should I do? And we have to share with organizations sometimes, well, let's take a step back. Let's really think through. So they almost skip that step, right, of thinking through the real problem they're trying to solve. Yes. Yeah. Well, part of the reason I included Ben, so that's a great comment, um, and his research and his book is he does rank – like, again, different categories and how to think about the tools. That's so that right. could be a good place to start. He's not, in, yeah. it's not, in, he's not endorsing anyone. It's not That's about right. that. It's more just, I mean, for me even, what are the categories? That's right. Like, how do you even decide, yeah. like, what is this that I'm looking at, you know? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, exactly. so that would be part of it, too. I think that's part of the overwhelm. And it's so funny when you talk about standing in HR tech, because I immediately located myself there, having been in the middle of HR tech, looking around right. at that ballroom or that exhibit hall trying right. to figure out, 
Who do I talk to? No, exactly. <laughs> and we have that that it's not a problem, but that opportunity to at Bullhorn with our marketplace. And there are so many new emerging technologies. Right. For someone to become, you know, a marketplace partner for Bullhorn, they have to prove out success. We have to see the business case that I shared earlier. How have they done X like that for companies you know, before we go? So if you're looking at new technologies, kind of use that as a guide. You know, how many customers are you actually doing this for? Can you share an ROI story with me or some of the questions I'd be asking? Great. So here's another question that came in. So who should we involve in my organization for this planning? It has to be a cross-functional effort. Um, obviously, technology teams, and whether that's an innovation team or an IT team, has to be involved, but it has to be done in conjunction with business leadership. So we've seen many organizations form almost an innovation or innovative technology alliance that includes members from all of these teams and generally has you know, an owner. And their core purpose is to understand the problems that they need to solve for the organization and then go out and understand how technology can solve them and essentially be that owner and that leader to help build the business case internally and bring everybody along. Okay. Well, that's, I think, really great advice that I hadn't thought about, which is a cross-functional team. Because I know sometimes we just think in silos. Yes. Right? If yes. I'm trying, like the Salesforce example, you know, I just would think about it from a sales perspective as opposed to looking across all of growth play. So that's, that's yes. really great. Yes. All right. I think um, we're coming up here. I don't see any other questions. Um, any closing comments that you would say, Gretchen, before we call it? call it a day here. No, thank you for this opportunity. It's been a great conversation and I'm looking forward to, you know, part two and there is so much to dig in here, but I hope we gave everybody, you know, some ways to think about this practically and steps to get started. Yeah, me too. It's been so much fun. I'm really glad that we're able to talk about it because I really am passionate that people not stay in the fear that they are not immobilized by what is possible for the future, that they see it as an opportunity. So I think, you know, hopefully that's what we've done. Um, as I said at the beginning, uh, the slides will be available, uh, downloaded, and then the recording of this call, because I know sometimes people just like to listen. Um, the other thing that Gretchen and I would make available, and you can reach out to me, is a consultation. I think there's probably some people who want to get started, they don't know how to get started, or they might need, to your point, they want you know, somebody to help them. We're happy to do that. Just reach out to me, uh, twick at growthplay.com, and then we'll figure out who the right person is to follow up with you. Sounds great. Right. Gretchen, thank you so much. Thank you, Tracy. Thanks, everyone, for being on the call, and thanks to my team for all their uh, assistance in making this possible. Have a great day.